Hey guys, let's talk about gastrointestinal surgeries tonight. So there's, um, you know, there's a variety of surgeries. I'm going to try to break them down by disease process so that you can better understand and kind of bring them all together. So um, first there's upper GI surgeries. Um, so we're talking about GERD and hiatal hernia here. So remember GERD is a problem of your lower esophageal sphincter or that door between your esophagus and your stomach. So we can do what's called a fundoplication. Think of it like putting on a winter jacket or a um, even more like a straight jacket around your um, lower esophageal sphincter. It's going to help to keep it nice and tight and closed because remember the problem with GERD is that flu, um, uh, <clears throat> the acid and the food contents are moving backwards. We also can manage Barrett's esophagus. We can burn or freeze off the tissue if there's abnormal tissue that starts to form from the erosion from the backup of the um, uh, we call it um, acid and food into the esophagus. Um, for a hiatal hernia, we can do a hernia repair, and we're going to just want to support that patient afterward. Um, you know, a lot of this is going to be to make sure, you know, no, um, nothing like bending, um, lifting, coughing, straining. Anytime you hear hernia, we definitely don't want to strain or do anything like that. We just want to support the patient as they are um, recovering. Let's talk about biliary surgery. So this is talking about the gallbladder. Um, most commonly these are done laparoscopically, but it is possible that they can be done open. Um, we, they, most of them can resume activities in one week. When we're talking about a, um, uh, what do you call it, um, a uh, coli, um, and uh, sorry that my, my mind just slipped real quick. <laughs> there's cholelithiasis and then there's um, cholecystitis. So if they're having inflammation of their gallbladder or cholecystitis, they, can, um, they need what's called a cholecystectomy most of the time. And that's where they actually remove the gallbladder um, that's inflamed, it may be infected. And so after they have this, I need to monitor for complications. Anytime a patient has a, uh, surgery, especially abdominal surgery, we need to watch for bleeding and infection. Something to know is that because of that laparoscopic approach, even though it decreases the risk for some complications, in order to accurately like view everything and see everything, they actually have to um, inflate the abdomen with CO2. And so um, what happens is that a lot of times these patients can be really bloated and have trouble getting rid of that CO2 after, um, after they do this procedure. And so they can actually have referred pain to their shoulder. Um, and so telling them to lay on their side with their knees flex can help to relieve some of that pain. Um, usually after having a cholecystectomy, a low fat diet is better tolerated. But again, every patient's going to be a little different. And some patients after a cholecystectomy may have um, a T-tube or other drains. So I need to monitor those closely if I am taking care of them. For cholelithiasis, which is stones, I remember cholecystectomy, um, cholecystitis, that's inflammation infection. ERCP is for cholelithiasis, which is stones. Remember the problem is obstruction. So I'm going to remove the stones and place a stent. And again, I'm going to just monitor them closely. I'm always going to be looking for signs that their problem is getting worse, monitoring anything that's invasive. I need to be monitoring for infection and bleeding as well. Let's talk about an appendix surgery. There's what's for, um, the most common thing that's done is an appendectomy or just removing the appendix. It's one of those organs that we don't actually really need. At least there's no um, reason that we need them today. Maybe there was in the past. Um, if perforation is present, they may need antibiotic therapy because they may be at risk. They'll be at risk for sepsis and shock and all that other not fun stuff, AKA death. Um, it usually takes about two to three weeks to recover from appendix surgery, and I'm going to manage their symptoms. They can have nausea, vomiting, or lack of appetite, and it's really key after these abdominal surgeries to get them moving. Um, and no heavy lifting or straining, of course, I don't want to increase that intra-abdominal pressure, and I'm going to monitor again for bleeding and infection. There's also surgery for gastritis or peptor, uh, peptic ulcer disease. So we can do what's called a partial or full gastrectomy. So remember this um, gastritis and peptic ulcer disease is where there's inflammation or ulceration of the stomach. And this can get so bad where they actually need to cut out all or part of the stomach. Um, and so pretty much taking out, um, getting rid of the problem. And so um, because part of the stomach is gone, there are gonna be a lot of uh, possible complications. So I need to monitor for dumping syndrome um, and kind of give them that teaching that we talked about in order to help to support them so that they have less chance of having the um, symptoms of dumping syndrome. I'm gonna be monitoring for blood glucose abnormalities. 
um, which are a part of the dumping syndrome um, that the body's trying to react to things getting dumped into the intestines too fast and can overcompensate with too much insulin. They can get like a hypoglycemia more often. Um, fluid and electrolyte imbalances are going to be common. And don't forget about that vitamin B12 deficiency as well. Um, so that pernicious anemia that can come up. Um, fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Oh, sorry, I already said that. I lied. Um, <laughs> respiratory status is also going to be key. Patients that have abdominal pain or abdominal surgery do not want to breathe. It hurts to take a breath. So we're really going to have to encourage them to use that incentive spirometer to prevent complications like atelectasis and pneumonia. A lot of these patients are going to have an NG tube, so I'm going to need to monitor that. I'm going to support their nutrition and monitor again for bleeding and infection. Other possible procedures a patient could have for gastritis or peptic ulcer disease might be a vagotomy, which is where they cut the a part of the vagus nerve so that you don't make so much gastric acid. Um, and also what's known as a pyloroplasty. So sometimes around the pylorus, which you know you have your lower esophageal sphincter, which is your esophag the, the door that goes in between your esophagus and your stomach. Then you have your pyloric sphincter, which is, goes between your stomach and your small intestines. Um, and what can happen is because of peptic ulcer disease or gastritis, it can actually get scar tissue and it can have trouble opening. So then you're kind of getting full of all this stuff and your stomach stays full and that can lead to a lot of um, really, really, um, side, uh, really bad side effects. And also when they do a vagotomy, a lot of times it can affect your ability to empty. Um, so as a whole, what a pyloroplasty is, it's kind of like widening. Think of it kind of like um, creating a stent or a better opening so that contents from the stomach can easier pass to the um, duodenum. Because again, you know, anytime you have contents in your stomach, um, your stomach's like, I need more acid. I need more acid to start breaking it down. Um, so it definitely can lead to more problems. So that's another procedure that sometimes is done. So there's other type of hernia, um, hernia repair. So we talked about a hiatal hernia repair. Um, and, you know, I really want to, you know, kind of, um, uh, we got to separate these that um, there's a her, uh, offer, uh, I, can, I can say that hernia offery or hernioplasty. So it's a repair um, versus a reinforcement of um, uh, for your hernia. So like if I need to repair the hernia, I do the hernia offery. If I want to reinforce, maybe like there was a mesh that needs to be reinforced, I can do a hernioplasty, but you can see it has hernia in the name. It's a laparoscopic surgery usually. Um, now this is gonna be if it's a non-emergent. If they actually have an emergent hernia, like it's strangulated or there's no blood flow to the tissue. Cause remember, if you remember what a hernia is, it's like there's um, tissue going where it's not supposed to cause there's a weak area. And um, what happens is that it goes into like an area it's not supposed to be, but sometimes it can get stuck and strangulated and um, the lack of blood flow to that tissue can lead to um, death of some of your tissues. Um, so in that case, they're gonna need an emergent like open abdomen bowel resection. Um, but if they're just having the simple repair or reinforcement to repair the hernia, I want to monitor their eyes and nose closely, um, tell, teach them to splint the incisions. Because remember, when you think hernia, think too much pressure. So I do not want any heavy lifting. No, um, They can deep breathe, but no coughing. And if they do have to cough or sneeze, they need to do it with their mouth open, not closed, because that increases that pressure. Um, and um, if they, um, for the splinting incisions, you know, that's especially like, you know, I want them to push a pillow when they need to cough or do other things. It's going to help to to kind of um, ease some of that pressure. Then specifically for inguinal hernias, uh, we need to do scrotal support, ice, and elevation. So those inguinal hernias can be so painful and there can be so much swelling. So they actually have special like, kind of like underwear or um, like a, um, it's not a splint, but um, it's like a special, um, what do you call it, um, type, uh, I say, type of drawers. <laughs> but type of uh, what you call it, device that you can wear um, that looks like underwear that actually helps to elevate the scrotum. Um, and then putting ice in it also helps as well. So then hemorrhoids. And again, do not get this confused with herniophory. I've seen students do this all the time on exams. They see herniophory um, and they see hemorrhoidectomy and they think it's for hernia or vice versa. They see um, uh, herniophory and think it's for hemorrhoids or hemorrhoidectomy and think it's for hernia. So hemorrhoidectomy. So look in the name, Her is it about a hernia or is it about a hemorrhoid? So um, for surgery for hemorrhoids usually consists of removal of the hemorrhoids. We can staple them, we can remove them, we can freeze them off, we can cut them off. There's a ton of stuff we can do. Um, but as a whole, my goals and what I'm trying to do post-op is control their pain. They can have a lot of pain with these. Now it feels better afterward and definitely a lot of times feels better than the hemorrhoid that they had, but it can take some time for the, to catch up with the pain. 
Um, infection management is key because they are, these are high risk for infection. Think of the area that these take place in. Um, what hangs out in your rectum. Uh, monitor for bleeding. So um, they're gonna have packing inside. And so definitely if they're bleeding through that packing or having issues with bleeding, I need to let the doctor know right away. It's a very vascular area down there. Um, sitz baths can help as ordered by the doctor. And um, strangely enough, I know you're going to think that this uh, sounds strange, but you know, your book talks about how there's no donuts or pressure relief rings should be used. And that's because, um, like, you know, I know it may think like, oh, hey, sitting on that's going to be so much more painful, but actually sometimes those donuts or pressure relief rings um, actually um, strangulate or cause less blood flow to those areas because it kind of, um, the way that it sits around your, um, your uh, coccyx and your buttocks is that it um, creates more pressure in that area. So we definitely do not want that. We want to decrease pressure and let the um, surgery site heal. Um, so let's talk about surgery for inflammatory bowel disease. For ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, they can get ostomies or bowel resections. Those are the most common surgeries that they're going to have. Keep in mind with Crohn's, it's more often that they have short bowel syndrome because remember we um, that's that patchy inflammation with Crohn's where it's kind of all throughout the bowel and it's all layers of the bowel. So there's more likely that they're going to get a lot more of their bowel cut out. And then on top of that, um, uh, what do you call them? Um, um, it's a lot more of that part of their bowel where they're going to be more at risk for malnutrition. Um, so I really need to be watching them closely and supporting their nutrition. Most people with Crohn's end up needing surgery. Not everyone with ulcerative colitis does, but most people with Crohn's end up needing surgery just because of the nature of where that inflammation is. Um, and then for bariatric surgery, last but not least, you know, that it can be a restrictive surgery, which is where they put a band on your stomach to make it smaller. They can cut part of your stomach into a sleeve. Um, they can put balloons in there, the intragastric balloons to decrease the size so that you don't eat as much, or that can, um, the most common is what's called a combination. It's a mix of a surgery that's going to decrease your absorption of nutrients so that you don't um, gain weight. And then also it's going to restrict the size of your stomach at the same time. That's the Ruan Y, and that's the most common one done. So postoperatively, you know, always think patients that are obese are going to be more at risk for complications. So I need to prevent um, blood clots and other common complications. Know that medications are going to stay longer in their system, so I need to be monitoring for side effects of those medication, um, medications, medications for a longer period of time. Oh. My cat's apparently wanting to talk about this. Um, I also need to prevent respiratory complications, um, you know, because remember, um, even after they've had their surgery, it's not that they're skinny overnight. They still have a large body habitus and they can have trouble taking big, deep breaths. And especially because this is abdominal surgery there, it's going to cause pain and discomfort, which will make it even harder to take deep breaths. Um, and so as a whole, just being obese, they're going to be more at risk for complications. So increase their head of bed, encourage that turn, cough, and deep breathe to really or how to pre try to prevent that atelectasis and pneumonia. Again, monitor for bleeding infection. Um, one of the side effects of bariatric surgery is what's called an anastomotic leak. Um, and that's uh, gonna be characterized by an increased heart rate, increased temperature, increased respiratory rate and chest and abdominal pain. And that's a leak at some of the incision sites. Um, so definitely um, be looking out for that specifically in this patient. You need to report that to the physician immediately. Um, there's uh, no straining or coughing in these patients because it can match with their suture lines and lead to serious complications. Um, pain management, like I said, is key because this is a major abdominal surgery um, and support their nutrition. There's no straws because that's going, they're going to ingest more air, which can lead to more problems. And we always start with liquid and low and go slow. So they always start with that high protein liquid diet, really, really small, like 15 mLs, little half a pill cup. And we're going to go slow um, to get them used to their new way of life. All right, that's all I have for, um, for different types of surgeries. I hope this helped to kind of um, differentiate some of these. See you next time.